This is Pastor Mark Biltz coming to you from El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom. Had a wonderful time in Israel. I will share just a little bit about uh, some of the things uh, that happened, some incredible divine appointments. I mean, God just intervened in so many different ways. Father, we just pray that you would circumcise our hearts, our eyes, our ears, that we could begin to know and understand you in ways we've never had before. We want to just jump into your word and learn more of you. And we just ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you. Let's start with our first PowerPoint. As you know, some of us just got back from Israel. Here we go. See, now doesn't uh, Nancy look scared approaching this camel? You know, how do you tame the wild beast? Well, Nancy knows how to tame the wild beast. You give it a kiss. You know, and does it work though? Of course it does. Woohoo! They are off and running. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, some of you know who this is. Most of you probably do not know who this is. This is David Wilder. David Wilder is a good friend of mine. He is the uh, chief spokesman uh, with the English language for the community of Hebron. Uh, he's the one that runs their website, and uh, he's the one that conducts tours in Hebron. And whenever he also travels and speaks about Hebron all over the, the world. He's also written hundreds, hundreds of articles about Hebron. He has his own blog. Uh, he speaks on Israeli politics and current events. Uh, he's been married over 29 years. He's lived in Kiryat Arba for 17 years. And uh, he's resided at Beit Hadassah, which is this house in Hebron for 10 years. He has seven children and many grandchildren. And Beit Hadassah, I'll show you this picture here. Here's where he lives with about 25 other families. And he showed me a holy book when I was there. Here's the holy book. Had a bullet hole through his book. Here's where a bullet hole went through the window of his house. Here's where the bullet hole went through the door of his house. And I'll tell you just a little bit about Beit Hadassah. And uh, back in 19, well, first off, it was liberated in 1967 at the Six Day War. And uh, around 1979, in the early spring, immediately after Passover, a group of 10 women and 40 children secretly went, because the Jews were not allowed to be in Hebron, but they could be in Kiryat Arba, which is just right next door. And so uh, what happened is in the middle of the night, 10 women and 40 children snuck into the house. The military didn't catch them. They went through a hole in the roof. And the following morning, they started singing songs. And these soldiers were just aghast. What is going on? They thought they were ghosts or something. They look, and here's these people in this building, these women and children. And so uh, they were all upset. And the uh, Israeli government, led by uh, Menachem Begin, he was very agitated at the nerve of these women and children uh, to go into this house when the Jews were not allowed to be in Hebron. But at the same time, he didn't want to forcibly remove the women and children from Beit Hadassah. So what did he do? He put the Israeli military around it and was going to starve them out. That's how he decided he was going to do it. Well, what happened was someone came up to them and said, well, hey, during the Yom Kippur War, when Israeli forces surrounded the Egyptians, uh, the Third Army, uh, he allowed them food, water, and medical supplies. So why can't you at least do it for your own people? So he decided to let in food and medical supplies to the women and children. Well, it so happens one of the women in the building was pregnant. And when there was an outbreak of hepatitis in Beit Hadassah, uh, brought on by the lack of running water and less than primitive hygienic conditions, the other women insisted that she leave the building, fearing for her health. But she refused, stating that if she wouldn't be allowed to return, because they said, you can leave if you want, but you can't go back. Well, here she was about to have a baby, and she was afraid if she left to have her baby, she wouldn't be allowed to go back. And so uh, she wouldn't leave. Well, as her due date approached, the other women again urged her to leave to give birth in a hospital in Jerusalem. And the government said, okay, you can have your baby and you can go back. And she said, absolutely not. 
what about my baby? Can my baby come with me? You just said I could go back. And they said, no, 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 okay, fine. So then she, they said, your baby can go back. So then she left. She had the baby, and then she came back with her baby. And so uh, the Israeli government finally allowed her. Uh, she gave birth to a daughter, and she named the baby Hadassah. And then she returned to the house of Hadassah, Beit Hadassah. And uh, there was, let me see... But in 1929, I don't have that particular part of this article here. In 1929, there was a bloodbath there. And a lot of the Arabs killed a lot of the Jews. Uh, but anyway, in the late spring of 1980, the women uh, had been in there for a whole year. Can you imagine? Women and children living in this one little room for a whole year. Uh, finally, Arab terrorists attacked the yeshiva students that were there. And the attackers began shooting and throwing hand grenades from the roof of the building facing Beit Hadassah. Uh, six young men were murdered, many others were wounded, and as a result of this terrorist attacks, the Israeli government decided to allow the women to reunite with their husbands and children in Beit Hadassah, and so it was repaired, and now it's in the Jewish hands. And this is where David Wilder lives. And he's an incredible man. He always leads the tours whenever I go there. And it so happens he's going, if you notice, we have five Mondays in November. The Monday before Thanksgiving, we're not meeting, just in case you're wondering, on Monday nights, because uh, the Church for All Nations is going to use this building for a conference. But I will have it confirmed this next Saturday or Monday. David Wilder can come and speak on Monday night. And what we're going to do, we'll go to the next clip. Right there at the Puyallup, in downtown Puyallup, they have a little community center. So if, here's another closer up view. But it's right here, and uh, I have a flyer I'll pass out. But we have the opportunity of having this man who can tell you stories that are just crazy. He'll be speaking on uh, Monday night, November 22nd, in Puyallup. I'm going to have it confirmed. He's got to fly from Israel to Los Angeles. And then he's going to catch a flight from Los Angeles to here just to speak to us before he goes back to Israel. So anyway, we'll have flyers out this weekend and next Monday night. You can promote it, let people know. The nice thing that uh, because it's going to be in Puyallup at a community center, there's a good chance we can have a lot of the Jewish people come too to hear them. And so it'll be really good. But I want to let you guys know about that at the Pioneer Park Pavilion. And we'll have the address and all of that. But that's going to be coming up. Mark your calendars. Monday, November 22nd. We won't meet here. But those that can, we will meet there. Uh, one quick story. Uh, also, before I get into the teaching, how God works is just incredible. Uh, on the Friday, we got to Jerusalem. We were up in the northern part of the Galilee. We go to Jerusalem. We go to the Ramada Inn. And one of our people, uh, Chuck, he had a room on the, like the first floor. I can't remember, but it might have been the second floor. But you know how a lot of vehicles, when they back up, they go beep, 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 back it up. Well, so happens, he was at the front of the building, like on the first floor, and the buses would pull up and go beep, beep, beep. He goes, oh my goodness, I can't sleep here. I can't stay. I have to have another room. You know, this is not going to work for me. And the hotel was full. There was not one room available. And so he didn't know what he was going to do. It just it was not going to work. Well, in, this is on a Friday, right? The next day is the Sabbath. In comes a rabbi. The rabbi finds out his room is on the eighth floor. He does not want to walk all the way up to the eighth floor. He doesn't like the Shabbat, you know, the elevator because it's a Sabbath. He walks up next to Chuck and Chuck goes, we'll switch. And he goes, great, let's do it. So there this rabbi now got to be on the first floor. Chuck got to be on the eighth floor walking right next to him. But then what is even more astounding, it just so happens this is also the Jewish rabbi that was going to bring out the Shabbat service for us that Friday night at the hotel. So it's the same rabbi, and neither one of them knew that they were with the other, you know, that he was with our group and that he was the rabbi, but he's the one that came and uh, did the Shabbat service that night in the hotel, the same rabbi. And they come to find out that evening he also flew from New York all the way to Jerusalem just for this weekend, and he flew right back to New York. But he was there for the weekend because he has uh, the fourth stage of cancer, and he wanted to go and pray at the Western Wall. So we were able to minister to him and his wife at the same time, but it's just amazing how God works. 
you know. So, but there's a lot of uh, interesting events that happened while we were there. We'll bring out more later. But uh, right now, let's jump into the teachings. If you have your notes, there's a lot of crazy things too in the news you may be aware of. Uh, I mentioned some of them on Shabbat, how they believe Rachel's tomb is really a, a mosque. And they're trying to get the cave of Machpelah where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried to be. They're saying it's a mosque and Israel cannot use those as their uh, heritage sites. Uh, and then also we read the report about uh, what the Vatican came out and said. How, I mean, here's what they said. You guys heard of replacement theology, right? He said this, this is what the Vatican came out and said, the Holy Scriptures cannot be used to justify the return of Jews to Israel. He went on to state that we Christians cannot speak of the promised land as an exclusive right for the privileged Jewish people. There is no longer a chosen people. But anyway, we live in interesting times. One other news report I just got right before I came here, and it's not... Confirmed by that confirmed. I mean it hasn't been set in stone But it's kind of interesting the report came out that uh, The US government is trying to bring peace to the Middle East and they thought well one way we could accomplish it is by saying Okay, Israel you can live in this land But you have to lease it from the Palestinians you have to pay them rent that way you can have the land But you lease it from the Palestinians and uh, one article said that Netanyahu agreed to do this, okay, but some of the, uh, but all of the Israeli government has to agree to this. It can't just be Netanyahu. Some of them said, forget that, it's got to be at least 99 years. Other people said, forget that, because that implies it belongs to them, you know. But what was interesting, what they're looking at right now and signing this year is a seven-year lease agreement, they said. This is kind of interesting. So we're going to, we'll just kind of watch and see what happens. But that's what they're proposing is a seven year lease agreement for the land, a peace agreement. So anyway, just kind of keep your eyes and ears open and tuned in. We live in interesting times. So uh, this was reported in both the Arab newspaper as well as the Jerusalem Post. But we'll see how it all turns out. One other thing, uh, interesting note, is there's a lot of talk about uh, the Palestinians unilaterally declaring a Palestinian state. And if that happens, it's, it's going to be quite interesting. So definitely keep Israel in your prayers this year. Let's see. Uh, on your notes, it begins with, what did Yeshua think of the Torah? How many believe that the Torah is God's word? How many believe Yeshua is God? How many believe that Yeshua wrote the Torah, basically? Okay, so the Torah is Yeshua's words. We all on the same page here. So what do you think of his own words? What do you think he thinks of his own words? So what we're going to do is look at some verses uh, in three key chapters of the Gospels. And we're going to see that Yeshua taught that the Torah was to be carried and taught wherever the disciples went. Now, that's a mind-blowing concept. I don't know if you caught that. It was the document teaching the redeemed how to walk in righteousness. Okay, the three uh, verses we'll be looking at, in the, or the three chapters, is from Matthew 5, Matthew 28, and Luke 24. And our purpose is to show exactly what I have on the screen there, was Yeshua came to properly interpret the Torah, not replace it. Did you catch that? Yeshua came to properly interpret the Torah, not replace it. Secondly, Yeshua instructed his disciples to teach Torah to their students. And thirdly, Yeshua set the interpretive principle when he said the Torah is all about himself. Now, there's two important points. And I believe everyone here believes that Yeshua is to be the model for every believer, right? Both outwardly and inwardly living his life in us and through us. I think everyone can agree with that. Now, in case you didn't know, there are believers who say the Torah was done away with. Okay, when Yeshua died for us. Now, that reminds me of another uh, email that I got. 
that I want to probably announce this Shabbat because I just didn't have time to get to it. But there is some very big anti-Israel videos that are going out right now. One of them is like God is with us is what it's called. Another one is called Bethlehem something. And it's been shown at Life Center and a couple of other churches how uh, it's totally just anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, uh, and it's incredible. But I'll give you more details on Shabbat about that. <clears throat> but anyway, if you remember what he said in the Aleph Bet video, Torah really means teaching or instruction, right? So I want to give you another perspective. If Torah means instruction or teaching, would it make sense to say that all of God's previous instructions were considered null and void when Yeshua died. Think about that. If Torah means instruction, and if you believe that when Yeshua died, then all of his instructions were now null and void, does that even make sense? It, it, it doesn't. It, it's, it doesn't make sense. So, what we're going to look at in Matthew 5 to begin with is, how many of you know context is so important whenever you're looking at any scripture? So who is the Messiah talking to? Well, let's look at Matthew 5, verse 1 and 2, first to see who he's talking to. It says, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them. So who is he speaking to? His disciples, his students. And now what is the topic? We're going to see in Matthew 5, the topic is the Torah. Look at Matthew 5, 16 through 19. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, what good works means, that doesn't mean taking out the trash for your mom necessarily, you know, or uh, cleaning your room. Whenever the New Testament speaks about good works, it's talking about the mitzvot, the mitzvah, the commandments. In other words, if God asks you to do something, you go and do it, and that's your good works. See, the difference is man wants to establish his own righteousness and do his own good works. We want to do what we think is right, not what God thinks is right. It's like you're working at Wendy's, and the manager tells you to make hamburgers, and you say, I don't do hamburgers. I really like to do landscaping. I want to go out and clean the parking lot. <laughs> okay. okay, well, then wait a minute. I want you to do hamburgers, okay? Well, that, the problem is... All too often, man tries to establish their own righteousness and do the works they want to do rather than the works that God wants us to do. Okay, and then it says, Yeshua says this, Don't think I've come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now that's a word that's totally misunderstood and I'm going to explain that for you shortly. Then Yeshua says, For verily, I'm telling you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah, till all be fulfilled. Whoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teaches others to do so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the commandments, the same will be called what? Great in the kingdom of heaven. So Yeshua taught Torah and commended those people who also taught Torah. Now, he said, if you teach, if you do Torah and teach Torah, you're going to be called what? Now, remember, everyone, the disciples were fighting over who was going to be the greatest. Look at Matthew 18, 1. At the same time came the disciples to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Matthew 18, 4. Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, 11, But he that is greatest among you shall be what? Okay, so what's, what is the thing he's teaching us? Who is the greatest? The one who lives under authority and doesn't think they're above the law. The, the, the little kids, they know they're under authority. It's the adults who don't like to think they're under authority. So the ones who do and teach what God desires for living as children in his kingdom are the ones who will be great. Now, do you remember in the verse I just read about the least of the commandments where he said, whoever shall break one of the least commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of God. Do you know what the least commandment was? There's like 613 commandments, guys, not 10. And the least one 
we find, well, before I read that, let's look at Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Here it says, another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of a mustard seed. And what do we know about the grain of mustard seed? It's like the smallest of the seeds. So think also of humility or the, the least person. It says, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is what? The greatest. It's the biggest. Okay, so it's, it's the, the smallest thing becomes the greatest. So again, it goes back to humility is the one who becomes the greatest in the kingdom. But then he says, and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. In other words, this tree cares for the little birds. It wants to protect the little birds. It cares for the little bird. It cares for those things which are least. And look at the least commandment in Deuteronomy 22, 6 and 7. It says, if by chance you see a place which a bird has made for itself in a tree or on the earth with young ones or eggs and the mother bird is seated on the young ones or on the eggs, don't take the mother bird with the young. See that you let the mother bird go, but the young ones you may take so it will be well for you and your life will be long. Now, I mean, we know that if you honor your mother and father, you have a long life. But here, the very least commandment, he says, if you care about that which is least, the little bird, you will also be add long life. And so what, are we, what is the principle that God is trying to teach us here that he cares for the little birds? Don't you know children have major psychological problem if they go around and injuring dogs, injuring cats, injuring birds? They got some, some major psychological problems when they injure. And it's the same thing. It's the person who picks on the littlest, the weakest, the youngest. They're the ones that have the major problems. And God is trying to tell us, even as big as he is and as great as he is, who is his concern for? The littlest, the, li the least. You know, so God wants us to be like him. And so we need to care for the things that are the least. Now, do you think because Yeshua died, that means we can no go around and kill birds and not care for the weak? See, that doesn't make sense. Just because Yeshua died doesn't mean now we don't have to care for that which is weak or the little birds. Okay, so let's look at this next clip right here. Okay, what in the world does it mean to abolish or destroy the law? Or what does it mean to fulfill the law? In Matthew 5, when he talks about destroying the law, it means to misinterpret it. When he says to fulfill the law, he means to give the proper interpretation or its fullest meaning. This is what it really means. So what Yeshua did to come was not to do away with the Torah, but to give its full meaning. He came to fulfill it. He came to say, look, this is what I was trying to say. I've mentioned this before. How many of you know email is not the best way to communicate? Especially feelings. That's why I have all these emotion cons. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm kidding or whatever. Well, the, the problem with the written Torah, it was great, but you couldn't get the feeling. So Yeshua was the living Torah, came to give its full meaning of what he was trying to say. And so he was telling his disciples, he came to give the proper interpretation, not to tell us the Torah is rendered inoperative. And I have this picture of these uh, students who are studying Torah. And one of them is misinterpreting the Torah and one would yell out, you're destroying the law. And he would say, no, no, I'm fulfilling the law. I'm giving the proper interpretation. And so the, the, the rabbis would always argue back and forth about who was giving the right interpretation to uh, the Torah. But I want you to understand when it talks about to destroy the law or fulfill the law literally means to give a proper interpretation or a wrong interpretation. It's not like a Greek mindset of a checklist. Okay, got that done. What's next? Oh, got that done. What's next? That's not what it meant at all. Uh, think of the Constitution. It, it really is Israel's Constitution. And how many of you know our Constitution today, people are misinterpreting our Constitution? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, does that mean the Constitution's done away with or just that it's wrongly interpreted? Well, it's the same thing with the Torah. It's been wrongly interpreted for a long time, but that doesn't mean it's rendered inoperative. It just means we need to understand what it's trying to say. Now, here's something else that I want to bring out that I think is so important when it comes to understanding the Jewish mindset of the Torah. How many of you remember the story in 2 Samuel 23, verse 15 and 16, 
where David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Okay, so what does that tell you? Here the king just said, made the comment, boy, we sure would like to have a glass of water. And these three guys said, we'll get you water. And they go through all this trouble to bring back the water. All right. Well, here's my point that I want to make about this. Look at this next picture here. Let's say some lady tells this young man, I really like roses. Okay. What do you think he's going to do? He may give her a dozen roses. Forget this one rose, I'm going to get you a dozen roses. Well, the Jewish mindset of the commandments, the Gentile mindset of the commandments is, ooh, law, legalism, bad. The Hebrew mindset of the commandments is, wow, God who we love has asked us to do something, so I'm going to be the first to do it, and I'm going to just, man, you want me to do this? I'm off and running, and I'm going to do it. It's to please the one who he loves. So it's not legalism, would it be? How would he think if the young man would say, you want a rose, you legalistic, fine, here's your rose. <laughs> I mean, is that going to go over very well? The Hebrew mindset of the commandments is, how can I please, you want me to do this? You betcha, I'll go do it. And I'm going to do it with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength because I love you, God. That's the difference between the Jewish mindset of the commandments and the Greek mindset of the commandments. Does that make sense? The other thing to realize is following the Torah is not a matter of salvation. That's important to put in here. It is a matter of sanctification. Living by the Torah is not a matter of you shoulds or you shouldn'ts. But it's a matter of letting the living Torah live his life through us. Now listen to this comment. So it's not us living in Torah, but the Torah living in us. Did you catch that? Now, what in the world are jots and tittles? Let me show you this picture. Here's what belongs in a mezuzah scroll. This is the Shema. As you can see right there, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And I want you to see that little letter Yod, which you have not learned yet. That's considered a jot. And what is a tittle? The tittle are these little tiny markings above these letters. You see these little tiny markings up here? Those are the tittles. And Yeshua said the least, just like the least of the commandments, the least little letter, which is the Yod or the Yud, is the smallest Hebrew letter. He said none of that's going to pass away. Until when? Heaven and earth passes away. And the last time I checked, it was still there. So here's the main points that I want to bring out. Yeshua came. Why did Yeshua come? To properly interpret Torah. And Yeshua declared. What did he declare? That the Torah would endure until heaven passes. And Yeshua spoke against those who forsook Torah teaching. That's what we just read. They'll be leased in the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua praised those who teach Torah. He identified those who are part of his kingdom. He confirmed the teachings of Torah with examples that we're going to look at. And he revealed himself as the supreme authority in Torah interpretation. Now, you're going to see that in this next section here. Let's look at Matthew 5 again, verse 20 through 28. Here Yeshua says, look, guys, I'm telling you, or I say unto you, that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he says this, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill, and whoever shall kill will be in danger of the judgment. But I'm telling you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in the danger of the judgment. So was he expanding it? Or is he doing away with it? He didn't say, okay, now you can be angry as soon as I die and hate your brother. No, he said, don't even be angry with them. He says, whoever says uh, to his brother Raka will be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say you fool will be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember your brother has ought against you, leave your gift at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift to me. 
He says, agree with the adversary quickly while you are in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, you shall by no means come out of there till you've paid the uttermost farthing. Now look what he says again. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not have committed adultery. But I say unto you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Okay, now what's going on here? From the Hebrew mindset, here's what's going on. First, let's look at Matthew 7, 28 and 29. It says, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Here's what that means. It was the habit of most Torah teachers to cite one or more sources to back up the validity of their interpretation of the verse. For example, they would typically quote another rabbi saying, Rabbi Judah says in the name of Rabbi Eliezer that this verse means this, right? But Yeshua is not doing that. He's saying, I'm telling you. He's not quoting these other rabbis. This rabbi said, this rabbi said. That's why they said he's teaching as one having authority because he's just telling you, this is what I'm telling you. He doesn't feel the need to quote these other rabbis who are misinterpreting it. Uh, see, they, they like to go by the oral Torah and go by what this rabbi said and that rabbi said. But Yeshua is saying, you have heard it said. In other words, all this oral Torah is wrong. You need to do what I'm telling you. Okay? So I also want to bring that out for you guys. I hope you guys caught that. All right. And so, uh, but anyway, Yeshua is not quoting other rabbis. Basically, who is his source? The Father. Let's look at this. In John 12, 49, he says, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me what? A commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Okay, so Yeshua only spoke what the Father said, didn't he? See, a lot of people think, well, the Father's commandments are all gone. Now we only keep Yeshua's commandments. Wait a minute. He didn't have any. He just quoted what his Father said. It was the source of his teachings, namely the Almighty God, that gave him his authority. He introduced no new commandments, but only properly demonstrated and gave the full meaning to the ones that were already given. What did he do? He stayed under the Father's authority. Now, the problem is, some of the Pharisees were trying to live out their own version of God's righteousness. This is what we find in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Now, watch this. This is important. It says... Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, those are good things, right? But then he says, some people will build with wood, hay, and stubble. And every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, look at this. If any man's work abide which he has built thereon, he will receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, He'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Wood, hay, and stubble don't do well in the fire. Gold, silver, and precious stones do good in the fire. So it goes back to what I was saying at the Wendy's restaurant. What is our works? We're saved by grace through faith. We're not saved by works, period, right? But here it says there are people who will be saved, but they have nothing to show for it for all eternity because they were doing their own works not his works. You following me? So gold, silver, and precious stone is kind of good. They survive fire, don't they? And they get purified. But look at this next verse. Well, verse let's look at 2 Timothy 2.20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. So, man... In the kingdom of heaven, do we want to get there as a vessel, but be a vessel of dishonor or a vessel of honor? But now look at this. Look at Psalm 119, 72. The Torah of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. <clears throat> Do you want something that's better than gold and silver? You better get a hold of Torah. That's what's going to endure forever, because I think he said his word endures forever. I think he said he even exalts his word above his name. And how many of you believe the Torah is the word of God? Okay. Romans 10, 4. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. 
For I bear them record they do have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. What's their problem? They're ignorant of God's righteousness. They go about trying to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Now, many of you know that that is a wrong interpretation. The word end literally means goal, like the end zone, the goal line. So the proper interpretation of that verse is the Messiah is the goal of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. So in other words, the Torah points to the Messiah. He's the goal of the Torah. Now, you know, I've mentioned this before, too. And if you go to a foreign country and you can't read the street signs or if the street signs are torn down, you get lost. And so the Torah is not the goal. The Torah points to the goal. So the Torah is the direction so people can know how to find the Messiah. Without the Torah, they're not going to be able to find the Messiah. Okay, <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk about is the continuity of Scripture. we only got about 15 minutes left, so I'll try not to go too fast. But how many of you realize that when they went to Sinai, they became the people of God, right? God basically betrothed them at Sinai. They were already the people of God when Leviticus 20, verse 26 was written. And here he says, You shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Okay? How did they become holy then? How, what, how, how was holiness achieved? God said, You're already my kids, and now... You're my kids. I want you to be holy. How was holiness achieved during that time? Keeping the commandments. The Gentiles didn't have any of those commandments. What separated them was the commandments. That's what made them holy. Now, they were already the people of God. Doing those commandments didn't make them the people of God. It's not like they were in Egypt and God says, okay, you keep all these commandments and then I will bring you out of Egypt. No, they were already redeemed. They were already baptized in the sea. They were already filled with the Spirit on Mount Sinai. And then he says, okay, guys, now that you're saved, you're baptized, you're filled with the Spirit, here's how I want you to be. Here's how I want you to live. I want you to be holy. Now, how many of you believe that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? So let's look at 1 Peter 1.16. Peter says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, now, wait a minute. He's quoting the Torah. And he talks about holiness. Did God somehow improve on his holiness? Was there any difference then than there was before? No. Would Yeshua ever contradict his own words? No. Psalm 138.2 is the verse I quoted earlier, where it says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. If you can't keep your word, what does that do to your name? So do you think God is going to give a word and say, okay, I want you to do this. Okay, now you don't have to. And then during millennial reign say, okay, now you have to again. It, it doesn't make sense. So the problem has been our interpretation that Yeshua is trying to straighten out. I mean, when you think about it, when you read the entire Tanakh or the Old Testament, why do you think God kept bringing judgment upon Israel? They didn't do what he said. Okay, so think about this. God is saying, you will be destroyed if you don't keep my word. And you think now he's going to say, okay, now I'm going to destroy you if you do keep my word. Why? Oh, legalism. You're following God's instruction. You're under the law. You're lost. Wait a minute. How can he say, I'm going to destroy you if you don't keep my word, and now he says, I'm going to destroy you if you do? I mean, that doesn't make sense, does it? Okay, now let's look at Yeshua's final instructions. How many of you heard of the Great Commission? Okay, well, let's take a look at it. Let's look at Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. That's the next verses we're going to look at. Here he says, I want you to go, therefore, and do what? Teach. Remember what he said about those who teach and do the commandments are called great? And now he's saying, I want you to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have what? Oh, man, do you know the word observe there is the same word in Hebrew where it says like keep, to guard, to protect. You know, it says keep the commandments. It means to guard and protect the commandments. Okay, well, here he's saying I want you to keep the commandments. I want you to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, what did he command them? Only things that the Father said. And he says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So they were commanded to teach the Torah. Everything Yeshua taught them was from where? Torah. When the serpent was attacking him in the wilderness, what did he quote? Torah. Why? Because it's a great defense. You can see why the devil wants Christians to throw out the Torah, because they've just thrown away their shield. And then, literally, if in the Greek here, where it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, the word go literally means as you are going. Okay? As you are going. But here's what I want you to catch this. He says, as you are going, I want you to teach and observe everything I've commanded you. As they are going. Say that phrase, as you are going. And it, whatever I commanded you. Say that, whatever I commanded you. Do you realize he's closing his final chapter in his life with the Shema? Look at Deuteronomy 6, and these words, which I command you, this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Basically, that whole Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is the Shema. I want you to teach these things I've commanded you as you are going. That's just a paraphrase of the Shema that he's saying. The disciple-making process consisted of teaching by word and example, as Yeshua did with them. The problem was, it's unlike some of the leaders of the day. Remember he said, I want you to do and teach the Torah? The problem with a lot of the scribes and Pharisees, they were just teaching and not doing. Now, let's close with Luke 24, verse 44 and 45. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written. Now look at these three different sections here. In the Torah of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding as they might understand the scriptures. So first off, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms are all about who? Yeshua. So he's saying the Torah is all about me, so why do we want to throw out the Torah. What we got to do is find Yeshua in the Torah. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the word Tanakh? Okay, the Tanakh is the better phrase for the Old Testament. Let's take a look here. This next clip. The Ta of Tanakh means the Torah, what Moses wrote. The Na of Tanakh is the Navim, which means the prophets. And the K of Tanakh is the Ketavim, which means the writings. And this is exactly what Yeshua was referring to when he says the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The Psalms are part of the writings. So he was referring to the, the, how the Torah or the Tanakh is outlined. And I believe every one of you got a sheet of paper that tells you how the, the Jewish Bible is lined out compared to the Christian Bible. All the same books. The Torah is first, but then what they do, they have the prophets next and the writings last. So their last book is not Malachi, but Chronicles. But they're all there, but in a different order. But study that sheet so you can get a better idea of what Yeshua was referring to. But the main thing to realize is each division speaks about the Messiah. So that's an important hermeneutical principle. And by hermeneutical, I mean interpretation. So an important way to interpret the Bible is to look for Yeshua in every verse. The key to understanding the Hebrew scriptures is to see them as an object lesson teaching us about the person or the work of the Messiah. Now, I like using the word Hebrew scriptures. How many of you know the New Testament was written by Jews? So that's the Hebrew scriptures too. So you can call the whole Bible the Hebrew scriptures. So Messiah brought full meaning to the Torah as the living example of its intended meaning. Now, here's what I want you to catch, too. The Torah is far more than a grand list of laws 
that are impossible to keep. It's really an instructional document teaching about God and his ways. It's a legal covenant between God and Israel. It's the national constitution of Israel. It's also a sacred marriage covenant. And uh, I want to tell you about two books that weren't on your book list, but I highly recommend, and they have good news. This first one is called Torah Rediscovered. You can read it for free online on our website. The whole book is free online. But it is an incredible book called Torah Rediscovered. Uh, if you want to buy it, you can buy it for a $16.99 uh, online. But you can read it for free in a PDF version on our website. The other book is called Take Hold. And believe it or not, I got online. We don't sell this book. But I went to Amazon.com. This book, you can buy at Amazon.com for one penny. And then it's $3.99 shipping. Okay, but I'm telling you, there's a ton of this book you can buy for like four or five bucks at Amazon.com. I highly recommend this book, Take Hold, and it's by uh, Berkowitz, B-E-R-K-O-W-I-T-Z, Ariel Berkowitz. But these two books are both written by him, Tour Rediscovered and Take Hold. These will revolutionize your uh, walk in Messiah. They're incredible books, and I highly recommend them. And then I close here with some questions to consider. What do the words to abolish or fulfill mean from a Hebrew perspective? What does abolish or to destroy mean? To misinterpret. And what does fulfill mean? To properly interpret. Now, how does Yeshua encourage Torah teaching? He tells us to teach others. That's how you make disciples. Teach everything that I'm telling you. And all he did was quote Torah. And so what does Yeshua instruct his followers to use in their disciple-making classes? How many churches really are into discipleship? But how many of them use Torah for their discipleship? And that's what he said to use. So what is the important hermeneutical principle that was taught by Yeshua? That what? It's all about him. The entire Tanakh is all about him. So when we're studying the Tanakh, we need to look at, okay, how can I, what can I learn about God here? I learned that he loves the little birds. And if someone big and strong can be so gentle and caring, he wants us to also be what? Gentle and caring. So we don't throw it out. What we do is look what we can learn about him. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you. Let's stand and we'll close with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much again for your word. And as people dig into your word, I pray, Lord, they truly would learn how it is all about you. You're all through there. You're just revealing your nature and your character to us and how much you care for the widow and the orphans and the fatherless. Father, I pray that you would just put that in each one of our hearts, that we would understand what the Torah truly is, is just you're telling us how to live righteously and to do those things that you had asked us to do, even as someone who loves another would run to fulfill the commandments, Father, that we would realize these commandments aren't just a bunch of do's and don'ts, but it's you telling us what pleases you. And I pray, Lord, that we would run to do them to show you how much we love you. Because we're already your kids. The neighbor kids you don't command. No one commands the neighbor kids what to do. They only command their own kids what to do. So, Father, we need to realize these commandments weren't given to make us your kids. It's because we're already your kids. And we want to do what pleases you and honor our Father. We just thank you for your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.